the true, proper, and eternal Sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Continuing in looking at four leading ways in which erroneous men have at different periods of the church history sought to nullify the vital doctrine of the eternal Sonship of Jesus, firstly some placing the Sonship of Christ in his incarnation. Looking at the passage in Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? But see how all the force and beauty of the passage are destroyed if the Lord Jesus were not the true and real Son of God before he was delivered up. The Apostle wishes to show the certainty that God will freely give us all things. But why should we have this certainty that we may rest upon it as a most blessed and consoling truth? It rests on this foundation, that God spared not his own Son. In the Greek, ideal, that is, his proper and peculiar Son, but delivered him up for us all. Here we have brought before our eyes the personal and peculiar love of a father towards a son. But though this love to him as his own peculiar Son was so great, Yet pitying our case, he did not spare to give him up to sufferings for our sake. But if he were not the true and real Son of God, but became so by being incarnate, the whole argument falls to the ground in a moment. If Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are mere names and titles, distinct from and independent of their very mode of subsistence, the Holy Ghost might have been the Father and sent the Son, or the Son might have been the Father, and sent the Holy Ghost. For if the three persons of the Trinity are three distinct subsistences, independent of each other, and have no such mutual and eternal relationship as these very names imply, there seems to be no reason why these titles might not have been interchanged. But take another passage of similar strength and purport. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. 1 John 4, 9. God is here declared to have sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. If men were but willing to abide by the plain, positive declarations of the Holy Ghost, and not evade them by subtleties of their own reasoning mind, this passage would of itself fully decide the whole controversy. Several things in it will demand and abundantly repay our closest attention. Firstly, the love of God towards us. Was not this from all eternity? Are not his own words, I have loved thee with an everlasting love? Jeremiah 31, 2. Secondly, the manifestation or proof of that love, which was sending his only begotten Son into the world. Thirdly, the person sent, which was no other than his only begotten Son. Now, was this love of God before or only just at the time when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us? All must admit that it was before, for it was the moving cause which induced God to send his only begotten Son. Then he could not become for the first time his son in the womb of a virgin, but must have been his only begotten son before he was sent. The mere act of sending could not make him to be his son if he was not so before. One would think that no elaborate train of reasoning was needful to prove this, and that simple faith in God's own testimony was amply sufficient. And so it would be were not men's minds so perverted by prejudice and drugged and intoxicated by a spirit of error that they obstinately refuse every argument or even every scripture testimony that contradicts their preconceived views. But what unprejudiced mind does not see that sending a person to execute a certain task does not make him to be what he was not before? A master sends a servant to do a certain work, or a father bids a son to perform a certain errand, or a husband desires his wife to execute a certain commission which he has not time or opportunity to do himself. The servant does not cease to be a servant, the son to be a son, nor the wife to be a wife by being so sent. You might as well argue that if I send my maidservant upon an errand, my sending her makes her to be my daughter, or if I send my daughter, it makes her my maidservant. My daughter for the time becomes my servant, as the Lord Jesus became his father's servant, but the relationship of father and daughter, as of father and son, existed prior to and independent of any act of service. 
But to put this in a still clearer light, if indeed so plain and simple a point needs further elucidation, consider the parable of the vineyard let out to husbandmen. See Matthew 21, 33 and following, Mark 12, 1 through 12, and Luke 20, 9 through 19. We need not go through all the parable, but may confine ourselves to the last and simple point of the householder, sending his son to receive of the fruits of the vineyard. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son, Mark 12, 6. What can be more plain all through the parable than that the husbandmen represent the Jews, the servants, the prophets, and the son of the household of the blessed Lord? But the point which we chiefly wish to dwell upon is the sending of the son. We read of the Lord of the vineyard, which is God, having Yet, therefore, one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last. Now, surely he was the one son, the well-beloved son, before he sent him, or the whole drift and beauty of the parable fall to the ground. The idea conveyed by the parable is evidently this. The Lord of the vineyard, which is God the Father, lived in a far country, at a long distance from the vineyard, that is, heaven, his dwelling place, With him there was his one son, and therefore his only begotten son, his well-beloved son, Luke 20, 13, dwelling in the same abode with himself, and therefore his son before he sent him, and quite independent of his being so sent. The husbandman, having refused to send the fruits of the vineyard by the servants, and having most cruelly treated them, the Lord of the vineyard makes, as it were, a last experiment. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? As if he took counsel with himself how he should act. He then comes to a decision in his own mind. I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him. Now, surely when the father thus consulted and thus determined, his son must have already existed as his son, been already at home with him before the counsel could be taken or the resolution executed. If then the parallel has any force, or indeed any meaning, and it would be sacrilege to say it has not, God the Father must have had a son in heaven with him before he sent him. If so, and we cannot see how the force of the argument can be evaded, the Lord Jesus Christ existed as the Son of God before he was sent by the Father. And if so, we cannot conceive a time when he was not a son. He is the eternal Son of the eternal Father. But we have other testimonies in the inspired record to the same import. Thus we read of God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, Romans 8, 3, and of his sending forth his Son made of a woman, Galatians 4, 4. There must surely be some meaning attached to the expression his own Son, analogous to a similar earthly relationship. If I were to write a letter to a friend and say in it, I send my own Son with this, He surely would not understand me to mean that he was not my own son until I sent him, or that the bare circumstance of my sending him made him my son. And if I were to write to him afterwards an explanatory letter to say that I did not mean in my former note that the bearer was really and truly my own son, but only that he became my son by bringing the note, would he not at once reply, What could be plainer than the declaration in your first letter that he was your own son? What other meaning could I attach to your words? And if I have misunderstood them, I shall not be able for the future to understand your plainest, simplest language. Apply this argument to the passages before us, wherein God is said to have sent his own son. We may well say, if the meaning of these passages be that the Lord Jesus Christ was not God's son before he sent him, but became his son by being sent, we must for the future give up all hope of understanding the scriptures in their plain, simple meaning. And surely those who assert that the Lord Jesus Christ was not the Son of God before he was sent, but became God's own Son by being sent, are bound to explain the connection between being sent and becoming a son, and to give some reason more valid than a preconceived prejudice against the eternal sonship of Jesus. But take another testimony of almost similar purport. The life which I now live in the flesh, says the apostle, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Now, when did the Son of God love Paul? Before he gave himself for him or after? It was because he loved him that he gave himself for him, and therefore he must evidently have been the Son of God before he gave himself for Paul. And when did he give himself? When he came forth from his father's bosom and assumed flesh in the womb of a virgin. If then the Son of God loved Paul before he came into the world, 
He must have been the Son of God before he came into the world. As the eternal Son of God, he loved Paul. And Paul believed and loved him as the eternal Son of God. One more testimony may for the present suffice. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1, 3, and 4. First, look at the words, Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The Son of God is here declared to have been made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Therefore, he existed as the Son of God before made of the seed of David. For all will admit that it is his humanity here spoken of as made. We grant, say the opponents of Christ's eternal sonship, that he existed before his incarnation, but not as the eternal Son of God. How then did he exist, and what was his title? The Word, they answer, according to the Declaration, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. According then to your own showing, the Lord Jesus Christ existed as the Word before he was made flesh. Undoubtedly, they reply. Now, what is the difference between the two expressions, His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and the Word was made flesh? For by parity of reasoning, if the Word existed as the Word before He was made flesh, the Son of God existed as the Son of God before He was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The two texts stand on precisely the same grounds. Both speak of the deity and of the humanity of the blessed Lord, and as no change can take place in his glorious deity, we justly infer that as he was the word in his divine nature before he was made flesh, so he was the Son of God in his divine nature before he was made of the seed of David. Do not all these scripture testimonies prove, as with one unanimous voice, that the Lord Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God before God sent him into the world? Sending him into the world no more made him God's son than to speak with all reverence. My sending my son to school makes him my son. Number two, another error on this important point is that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The main prop of this view is what we read in Acts eight thirty two and thirty three. And we, excuse me, Acts 13, 32 and 33, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. But the meaning of the apostle is abundantly clear from the passage already quoted in Romans 1.4. His resurrection did not make him, but manifested him to be the Son of God. Did not the Father before the resurrection, twice with a voice from heaven, proclaim, This is my beloved Son? Matthew 3.17, Matthew 17.5. This is my beloved Son. Will any man then lift up his voice against the majesty of heaven and say that Christ was not the Son of God before his resurrection, which he clearly was not, if the resurrection made him such? Why, the Roman centurion who stood at the cross had a better faith than this when he said, Truly, this was the Son of God, Matthew 27:54. Nay, the very devils themselves were forced to cry out before his sufferings and death, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God, Luke 4:41. We may be sure, therefore, that none but a heretic of the deepest die could assert that the blessed Lord was not the Son of God till made so by the resurrection. 3. Another erroneous view of the Sonship of Christ is that he is so by virtue of his exaltation to the right hand of God. This view is founded upon a mistaken interpretation of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Christ was made so much better than the angels, not as the Son of God, but because that as that he was better than they already, being indeed their maker and creator, John 1.3, Colossians 1.16. Nor did he become God's son by being appointed heir of all things and obtaining by inheritance a more excellent name than all the angelic host. If I have an only son and he inherits my property, his being my heir does not make him my son, but his being my son makes him my heir. 
So the blessed Jesus is God's heir. But the beauty and blessedness, the grace and glory, the joy and consolation of his being the heir of all things lie in this, that he is such in our nature, that the same blessed Emmanuel who groaned and wept, suffered and bled here below, is now at the right hand of the Father as our high priest, mediator, advocate, representative, and intercessor, that all power is given unto him in heaven and earth as the God-man, Matthew 28:18, and that the Father hath set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. But he has all this preeminence and glory, not to make him the Son of God, but because he who as the Son of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 7-11 through 11. The joy of heaven above, the delight of the saints here below, their only hope and help, Strength and wisdom spring from this, that the Son of God is exalted to the right hand of the Father in the very nature which he assumed in the womb of a virgin. But if he were made the Son of God by this exaltation, it sinks his deity by merging it into his humanity and constitutes him a made God, which is not God at all, but an idol. In fact, these three views which we have endeavored to strip bare out of their party-colored dress are all of them either open or disguised Socinianism, and their whole object and aim are to overthrow the deity of the Lord Jesus by overthrowing his divine sonship. The enemies of the Lord Jesus know well that the scriptures declare beyond all doubt and controversy that he is the Son of God. This mountain of brass they may kick at but can never kick down. But they know also that if they can by any means nullify and explain away his sonship, they have taken a great stride to nullify and explain away his deity. Beware then, simple-hearted child of God, lest any of these men entangle your feet in their net. Hold by this as your sheet anchor, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, in his divine nature, as his eternal and only begotten Son." Faith in him as such will enable you to ride through many a storm and bear you up amidst the terrible indignation which will fall upon his enemies when he shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Number four. But there is another way in which erroneous men seek to explain and by explaining deny the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus and that is by asserting that he is a son by office. These men do not deny his essential or eternal deity, nor do they seek to overthrow the Trinity. On these points they are professedly sound. We say professedly, for we fully believe that the deity of Christ and the very doctrine of the Trinity itself are so involved in the eternal sonship of Jesus that they stand or fall with it. This, however, they do not or will not see and call themselves believers in the trinity of persons and the unity of essence in the great and glorious self-existent Jehovah, but they do not believe that Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are necessarily and eternally such, and neither are, were, or could be otherwise, but that they are covenant offices and titles which they have assumed and by which they have made themselves known to the sons of men. Thus they do not believe that Christ is the Son of the Father by eternal generation, His only begotten Son, His Son in truth and love, but that the three distinct persons in the Trinity covenanted among themselves the Father to be the Father, the Son to be the Son, and the Holy Ghost to be the Holy Ghost, and that chiefly for man's redemption, monstrous figment, God-dishonoring error 
which needs only to be stated to be reprobated by every believer in the Son of God as a deadly blow against each person in the Trinity, and destroying that eternal intercommunication of nature without which they are three distinct gods and not three distinct persons in one undivided Godhead, truly Satan introduces no little errors into the church. Truly all his machinations are to overthrow vital truths and to poison the spring at the very fountainhead. We bless God that there is a covenant, a covenant of grace, ordered in all things and sure. We adore His gracious majesty in that this everlasting covenant, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost sustain certain relationships to the church of God. But we most thoroughly deny that these relationships made them to be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and that separate from them, the Father is not really and truly the Father to the Son, nor the Son really and truly Son to the Father, but only nominally so. For who does not see that if this be true, the Father might have been the Son, and the Son might have been the Father, and the Holy Ghost either the Father or the Son? For certainly if they are so, not by nature but by office, and are three equal independent persons at liberty to choose their several titles, there appears to be no reason why they should not have chosen otherwise than they did. We see, therefore, into what confusion men get when they forsake the simple statements of Scripture. The simple statements of Scripture, and what perilous weapons they hold in their hands when they directly or indirectly sap the very throne of the Most High. But to clear up this point a little further, let us illustrate it by a simple figure. Suppose, then, that three friends of equal rank and station were to go on a journey, say a foreign tour, they might say to one another before they started, Let us severally choose the three departments to which we shall each attend. I will take this part, if you and you will take that, and that. Now, why might they not, as three friends of equal station, without any tie of kindred, choose different departments from what they actually selected? For there was no anterior binding necessity that they should have chosen the exact offices which they fulfill. The same reasoning applies to the three co-equal persons of the Trinity. If Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be but mere covenant names, titles, and offices, and not their very mode of existence. But it will be said by such men, You carnalize the subject by your figure. Not so. We have too much reverence. We trust for the things of God to carnalize them. But we use the figure to meet you on your own ground, and to show you by a simple argument the absurdity and folly, not to say the impiety of your views. We admit, nay, more, we rejoice to believe that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost sustain each distinct their relationships in the eternal covenant. But these relationships are not arbitrary offices which they might or might not have severally chosen, but are intrinsically and necessarily connected with and flow out of their very subsistence, their very mode of existence so that to talk, as some have done, that the three persons in the Alhelm, to use their barbarous Hebrew, covenanted among themselves to be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is an abominable error, and tantamount to declaring that but for the covenant the Father would not have been the Father, nor the Son the Son, nor the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost. Where is there one scripture for such an assertion? when the blessed Jesus in that sacred heart-moving prayer lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, John 17. Was there no other relationship, no more intimate and eternal tie than being his Son by assuming an office? We cannot express what we have seen and felt in that most blessed and sacred chapter, perhaps the most solemn in the whole Word of God. But there is that tender intimacy, that holy, filial communion with His heavenly Father breathing through it, which conveys to a believing heart the fullest assurance that He is the eternal Son of God as being the only begotten of the Father. But as we cannot convey to erroneous men our faith, we must meet them on the solid ground of scriptural argument. Nothing then can be more evident than that the one great and glorious Jehovah existed in a trinity of persons before the covenant. 
What then were those three persons before the covenant was entered into? Did that covenant alter their mutual relationship to each other so as to introduce a new affinity between them? You might just as well say that the covenant made them a trinity of persons or called them into being as to say that the covenant made them Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. For if these be but covenant titles, had there been no covenant, they most certainly, according to your own showing, would not have been Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is indeed overthrowing the Trinity with a witness and making the distinct eternal subsistence of three persons in the Godhead depend upon a covenant made on behalf of man. For remember this, that you cannot touch one person of the Godhead without touching all. And if you say that the Son of God is a Son only by office, you say with the same breath that the Father is only a Father by office and the Holy Ghost only a Holy Ghost by office. But let us further ask, what do you mean by saying that the Son of God is so only by office or as a name or title? Has the Son of God, his only begotten Son, no more real, intimate, and necessary relationship to his Father than calling himself his Son, when he is not really his Son, but only so by office? Do you think you clearly understand what it is to be a Son by office? For persons often use words of which they have never accurately examined the meaning. The Lord Jesus, by becoming man, became the Father's servant by office. But if you make him a son by office, you strip him of all his glory. His glory is this, that though he was a son by nature, he became a servant by office, as the Apostle says, though he were not became a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5.8 in this we see his unparalleled condescension, his infinite love, and boundless depths of grace, that though by nature the eternal Son of God, and as such co-equal with the Father, he stooped to become a servant. But apart from all scripture revelation, it is an absurdity, an insult to common sense, to make the Lord Jesus Christ a son by office. There are but two ways by which anyone can become a son, one by generation, two by adoption. In the first case, he is the father's son, his true, proper, and real son. In the other, his made or adopted son. No office or service, no law or title, no covenant or agreement can make a son if he be not a real or an adopted one. A servant by office may become a son by adoption, as Abram complained that one born in his house as a servant was his heir. And as Moses became the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Exodus 2.10. And a son by nature may become a servant by office, but a son by office is an absurdity, both in nature and grace. Now, do look at the weight of these plain and united testimonies. Would God deceive us by telling us again and again that he had a son, an own, a proper, a peculiar, and only begotten son, if he had not? Where in all these passages is there the faintest intimation that the sonship of Christ was not a true and real sonship, but only a name, a title, a word that might or might not have been, and but for the creation of man never would have been? To make the mutual eternal relationship which subsists between the Father and the Son depend upon a covenant made on behalf of man is to destroy the very eternal being of both Father and Son. Surely, when the Father spoke himself from heaven, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. He meant that he was really and truly his beloved Son, that he was his most loving Father, and that we were to hear, believe in, and obey him as such. There are two things which every child of God has the greatest reason to dread. The one is evil, the other is error. Both are originally from Satan. Both have a congenial home in the human mind. Both are in their nature deadly and destructive. Both have slain their thousands and tens of thousands, and under one or other, both of them combined, all everlastingly perish but the redeemed family of God. Evil, by which we mean sin in its more open and gross forms, is, in some respects, less to be dreaded than error, that is, error on vital, fundamental points, and for the following reason. The unmistakable voice of conscience, the universal testimony of God's children, the expressed reprobation of the world itself, all bear a loud witness against gross acts of immorality. Thus, though the carnal mind is ever lusting after evil, thorns and briars much hedge up the road toward its actual commission, 
and if by the power of sin and temptation they be unhappily broken through, the return into the narrow path, though difficult, is not wholly shut out. David, Peter, and the incestuous Corinthian fell into open evil, but they never fell into deadly error, and were not only recoverable, but by superabounding grace were recovered. But error upon the grand fundamental doctrines of our most holy faith is not only in its nature destructive, but usually destroys all who embrace it. As, however, we wish to move cautiously upon this tender ground, let us carefully distinguish between what we may perhaps call a voluntary and involuntary error. To explain our meaning more distinctly, take the two following cases of involuntary error by way of illustration. A person may be born of Socinian parents and may have imbibed their views from the force of birth and education. Is this person irrecoverable? Certainly not. The grace of God may reach his heart and deliver him from his errors just as much as it may touch the conscience of a man living in all manner of iniquity and save him from his sins. Or a child of God, one manifestly so by regenerating grace, may be tempted by the seducing spirit of error breathed into his carnal mind by a heretic or by an erroneous book, and may for a time be so stupefied by the smoke of the bottomless pit as to reel and stagger on the very brink, and yet not fall in. Most of us have known something of these blasts of hell, so that we could say with Asaph, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, but they have only rooted us more firmly in the truth. These are cases of what we call involuntary error. Involuntary error. But there is voluntary error when a man willfully and deliberately turns away from truth to embrace falsehood, when he is given up to strong delusions to believe a lie, when he gives heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and seeks to spread and propagate them with all his power. These cases are usually irrecoverable, for such men generally wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Error so blinds their eyes and hardens their hearts that they cannot or will not see anything but what seems to favor their views, and at last they either sink into a general state of unbelief and infidelity or die confirmed in their deceptions. It is scarcely possible to read the epistles of the New Testament, especially those of Paul to Timothy and Titus, and those of Peter, John, and Jude, without being struck by the strong denunciations which those inspired men of God launched as so many burning thunderbolts against error and erroneous men. Any approach to their strong language, even in opposing the most deadly errors, would in our day be considered positively unbearable, and be called the grossest want of charity. It is with most an unpardonable offense to draw any strong and marked lines between sinner and saint, professor and possessor, error and truth. The ancient landmarks which the word of truth has set up have almost by general consent been removed, and a religious right of common has been established by means of which truth and error have been thrown into one wide field, where any may roam and feed at will and still be considered as sheep of Christ. It was not so in the days of Luther, of John Knox, and of Rutherford, but in our day there is such a general laxity of principle as regards truth and falsehood that the corruption of the world seems to have tainted the church. There was a time in this country when, if there was roguery in the market, it was not tolerated in the counting house. If there was blasphemy in the street, it was not allowed in the Senate. If there was infidelity in the debating room, it was not suffered in the pulpit. But now bankers and merchants cheat and lie like costermongers. Jew, papist, and infidel sit side by side in the House of Commons, and negative theology and German divinity are enthroned in independent chapels. It would almost seem that Paul, Peter, John, and Jude were needlessly harsh and severe in their denunciations of error and erroneous men. That Luther... John Knox and Rutherford were narrow-minded bigots, and that it matters little what a man believes if he be a truly pious man, a member of a church, a preacher, or a professor. Old Mrs. Bigotry is dead and buried. Her funeral sermon has been preached to a crowded congregation, and this is the inscription put by general consent upon 
the tombstone of old Mrs. Bigotry. For modes of faith let graceless bigots fight. He can't be wrong whose life is in the right. But if to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints be bigotry, let us be bigots still. And if it be a bad spirit to condemn error, then let us bear the reproach, rather than call evil good and good evil. Put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Here then we resume our subject, hoping with God's help and blessing, whilst we contend earnestly for the truth as it is in Jesus, to advance nothing that may be in the least inconsistent with his sacred word, and desiring his glory and the good of his people. But as Abraham, when he went up the mount with Isaac, left the young men and the ass at the foot, as Moses put off his shoes at God's command when he stood on holy ground, so must we leave carnal reasoning at the foot of the mount where the Lord is seen, Genesis 22:14, and lay aside the shoes of sense and nature when we look at the bush burning with fire and not consumed. Four things are absolutely necessary to be experimentally known and felt before we can arrive at any saving or sanctifying knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. One, divine light in the understanding. Two, spiritual faith in the heart. Three, godly fear in the conscience. Four, heavenly love in the affections. Without light, we cannot see. Without faith, we cannot believe. Without godly fear, we cannot reverentially adore. Without love, we cannot embrace him who is the truth, as well as the way and the life. Here, all heretics and erroneous men stumble and fall. The mysteries of our most holy faith are not to be apprehended by uninspired men. Spiritual truths are for spiritual men, as the apostle beautifully says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. It is therefore utterly impossible for men who are sensual, not having the Spirit, to understand any branch of saving truth, much more the deep mysteries of godliness. We must be taught of God and receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child, or we shall never enter therein. And it is for those who have been so led and taught that we mainly write. We have already attempted to show the various ways in which erroneous men have sought at different times to overthrow the eternal sonship of Jesus. If we have succeeded with God's help and blessing in refuting what is false, we have advanced a good way in proving what is true. For in grace as in nature, the conviction of falsehood is the establishment of truth. Before then we proceed any further, let us fix our foot firmly on the ground that we have thus far made good and not run backwards and forwards in confusion as though we had proved nothing. What is proved is proved, and as each successive step in an argument is clearly and firmly laid, it forms, as in a building, a basis to support a fresh layer of proof. These points, then, we consider to have been already fully established by us from the word of truth. 1. That Jesus is the Son of God. 2. That he is not the Son of God by the assumption of human nature, or by the resurrection, or by sitting at God's right hand, or by virtue of any covenant name, title, or office. 3. That he was the Son of God before he came into the world. And 4. That he consequently is the Son of God in his divine nature. The pre-existerian dreams and delusions we need not say we utterly discard as full of deadly error and therefore need not stop to show that he is not the Son of God by virtue of a human soul created before all time and united to his body in the womb of a virgin at the Incarnation. Here then we take our firm stand that Jesus is the Son of God in his divine nature. And if that divine nature is truly and properly God, as the words necessarily imply, and as such is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, 
then he must be the eternal Son of the Father. No sophistry can elude this conclusion. Forsaking the Scriptures and the guiding light of divine revelation, you may reason and argue on natural grounds and cavil at the words an eternal Son and eternal generation as expressing or implying ideas naturally inconsistent, not to say impossible, but we shall not follow you on such boggy ground. If you will do so, lose yourself there and led by the ignis of fatus of reason, flounder from swamp to swamp till you sink to rise no more. But we shall, with the Lord's help, abide on the firm ground of God's own inspired testimony and draw all our proofs from that sacred source of knowledge and instruction. But though we shall confine ourselves to the inspired testimony in opening up this subject, we shall endeavor to proceed step by step, carefully and prayerfully, in the hope that our pen may move in strict harmony with the truth of God in a matter so mysterious and yet so blessed. Follow us, spiritual reader, with the scriptures in your hand and with faith and love in your heart, that we, as taught and blessed of God, may be able to set our seal to those words, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. If we have not this, what witness have we worth possessing? First, then, we lay it down as undeniable scripture truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God as God. This is the express testimony of the Father himself. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews 1.8 Is it not clear from this express declaration from the Father's own lips that the Son is God, and God as being the Son? How else is he the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person? Hebrews 1.3 The human nature of Jesus was not the brightness of God's glory, for how could a created finite nature represent the brightness of the glory of the infinite, self-existent I Am? Nor could the nature assumed in the womb of a virgin be the express image of God's person. The person of God must necessarily be divine, and the express image of it must be necessarily divine also. Secondly, we assert that when the scripture speaks of Jesus as the only begotten Son of God, it speaks of him as such in his divine nature. Thus, when John says, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, in John 1.14, that glory was the glory of Christ's divine nature. For how could his human nature, which was marred more than the sons of men, shine forth with the glory of his divine? This glory of the only begotten of the Father is most evidently the same glory as that of which Jesus speaks in these touching words. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17:5. But this must be the glory of his divine nature, for his human nature he had not been assumed. Then the glory of the only begotten of the Father must be the same glory as he had with him before the world was, and that could be none other but his divine. Thus we are brought in the clearest and most indubitable manner to this point, that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God as God. The two passages that we have quoted bring us to this conclusion with all the clearness, force, and distinctness of a mathematical problem. Examine one by one the links of this argument, and see if they are not firm and good. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. This is the first step. As the only begotten of the Father, he has a peculiar glory. This is the second step. This glory he had with the Father before the world was. This is the third step. As he could only possess this glory in his divine nature, for his human did not then exist, he is the only begotten Son of God as God. This is the fourth step, and establishes the conclusion that he is the eternal Son of the Father, and that by eternal generation. You may object to the term eternal generation, but how else can you explain the words the only begotten of the Father? If you say that this refers to the human nature of Jesus, how can you interpret in that sense the passage the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father? John 1.18 Surely you will not say that the human nature of Jesus was in the bosom of the Father from all eternity. How was he ever in the bosom of the Father but as his only begotten Son? And if he lay there from all eternity... What is this but eternal generation? 
But we have by no means exhausted our quiver. Thine arrows, we read, are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Psalm 45, 5. The Lord fill our quiver full of them. Then shall we not be ashamed, but shall speak with his enemies in the gate. Look at the following testimony. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Does not Jesus himself here declare that the Father gave his only begotten Son? Was he not then his only begotten Son before he gave him? If language mean anything, the words positively declare that God had a Son, an only begotten Son, and that he so loved poor fallen man that he freely and voluntarily gave this only begotten Son for his redemption. But when did God love the world? Before or after Jesus came in the flesh? Of course, before, for love moved him to give his only begotten Son. Where then was his only begotten Son when God loved the world? In heaven with God. And what was he in heaven with God? His only begotten Son. Then he was his only begotten Son in his divine nature. For his human nature never was in heaven till after the resurrection. And if his only begotten Son in his divine nature, and if he existed as such from all eternity, what is this but eternal generation? Surely Jesus knew the mystery of his own generation, and if he call himself God's only begotten Son, is it not our wisdom and mercy to believe what he says, even if our reason cannot penetrate into so high and sublime a mystery? Where reason fails with all her powers, there faith prevails, and love adores. 3. But you will say, We do not deny that Jesus is God's only begotten Son, for so the Scripture speaks, but He is so by virtue of the everlasting covenant. But how could a covenant beget Him? Begetting implies a being, not a compact, and to be begotten implies a nature, a mode of existence, not a covenant. The two ideas are essentially incompatible, for begetting implies a relationship independent of and anterior to a covenant, whereas a covenant implies the existence of the covenanting parties. But another may say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but neither by virtue of his divine nor of his human nature viewed separately, but of his complex person as God-man-mediator. But was his complex person in heaven before the Incarnation? Surely not. But that the Son of God was in heaven before his incarnation, we have already abundantly proved. It is evident, then, that he is not the Son of God by virtue of his complex person, for he was so before he took our nature into union with his divine. He must be the Son of God either as God or as man. We have shown over and over again that he is not the Son of God as man, what then remains but that he is the Son of God as God, and therefore previous to his assumption of our nature in the womb of the Virgin, and consequently anterior to his becoming God-man? Has not the Lord himself declared, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God? Do you believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God? How can you if you deny that he is the eternal Son of the Father? For we have already proved from Scripture that he is the only begotten Son of God in his divine nature. And he who denies that most certainly believes not in his name by which is meant his very being and nature, person and work, as revealed to the sons of men. But, as the matter is so important, let us now examine another testimony. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, 1 John 5.20. Carefully examine the mind and reasoning of the Holy Ghost in this remarkable declaration, for it is well worth weighing word by word. We know, says Holy John, that the Son of God is come. But how do we know that the Son of God is come? by the personal and experimental manifestation of him as the Son of God to our soul, Galatians 1.16. But if not so manifested, not known. And who understand and know him that is true? Those to whom he hath given an understanding. Then where no such understanding is given, there he that is true is not understood or known. 
And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. Then, if not in union with the Son, not in him that is true, and therefore necessarily in him that is false. This is the true God. Who? The Son. And why? Because he is the Son, and eternal life. Then out of him is eternal death. Why? Because only in union with him is eternal life. Look at the chain as thus drawn out from beginning to end. Weigh it well, link by link. The Son of God is come. That link is the first. We know that He is come. That link is the second. He hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. That is link the third. We are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. That is link the fourth. This is the true God and eternal life. That is link the fifth. And may we not with Holy John add another link to close the chain? Little children, keep yourselves from idols, and amongst them from the idol of a son by office, for such is not the true God, nor eternal life. Fourthly, but now let us advance a step further in our line of argument and show that Jesus is not only the Son of God in his divine nature, but as being the only begotten of the Father, is God's own proper, true, and eternal Son. Take the following testimonies by way of proof of this assertion. For we, for excuse me, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Romans 8, 3. Here the Holy Ghost declares that God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Have you ever carefully weighed the meaning of the words, His own Son? If you are a father, does not your own son widely differ from an adopted son? The word means literally his proper and peculiar son, his own. In a sense, specially distinct from any other. But let us examine this passage a little more closely. A certain work was to be done which the law could not do, for it was weak through the flesh. The law was strong in itself, for it had all the authority of God to back it. But it was weak through man's infirmity, the flesh not being able to keep or obey it. God then sent his own Son to do what the law could not do. If words have any meaning, if the blessed Spirit choose suitable expressions to convey instruction, what can we understand by the term God's own Son, but that Jesus is God's true and proper Son by his very mode of existence? This is the grand and blessed revelation of these last days, as made known to the apostles and prophets, and embodied in the inspired pages of the New Testament. What, for instance, is the foundation of the first chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, and indeed of the whole epistle, but that the Son of God has a relation to the Father, not only of a dignity, but of a nature which he alone possesses. How clear and emphatic the language in which the apostle opens that weighty epistle. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. View the Son thus spoken of as a Son merely by office or by covenant title, and the whole force and beauty of the words are lost. But see in the Son the true and real Son of the Father, then the love and mercy of God, as speaking in and by Him in these last days, shine forth in all their unparalleled luster. So, in the words just quoted from Romans 8, 3, the whole foundation of redemption is laid on this rock that God sent His own Son. Can language be more plain or more positive? If Jesus be not God's own Son, His true, real, and proper Son, what do the words mean? We say it with all reverence that if Jesus be a Son only by His office or merely by virtue of His complex person, such words as His own Son would but mock and deceive us and lead us to believe a lie. If I were to point it to a son of mine and say to a neighbor or a stranger, This is my own Son. And a few days after, the person learnt that he was not my own son, but an adopted child whom I was accustomed to call my son when he was no such relation. Should I stand clear of deception in the matter? If God then declares that Jesus is his own son, am I to believe that he is his son by nature, his only begotten, and that his true and proper son 
or to make him a liar. It seems to us that the holy John has already decided the matter. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. This is just your case. If you say that Jesus is not God's own Son, which you must certainly do if you say that he is not his Son in his divine nature. You do not believe God because you believe not the record or testimony that God gave of his Son when he said from heaven, This is my beloved Son. And what is the consequence? You make God a liar. And is not that an awful position for a worm of earth to stand in? But such is ever the result of listening to natural reasoning and argument instead of believing the testimony of God. But again, have you ever looked at the word sent in the passage that we're now considering? There is a singular beauty and propriety in a father sending a son, which is completely lost if the second person is so far independent of the father as to be a son merely in name. As such, he might certainly covenant to come, but could hardly covenant to be sent. But view him as the Father's own Son, and then the love of the Father in sending him, and his own love in consenting to come, lo, I come, are beautiful beyond expression. But this is by no means the only passage in which Jesus is spoken of as God's own Son. Look at those words in the same blessed chapter, Romans 8, which has comforted thousands of sorrowful hearts. He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Can words be more expressive? He that spared not his own Son Believing soul, you that desire to know God's truth for yourself, who would not hold error for a thousand worlds, and are looking up for that wisdom which cometh from God, consider well the words, they are full of truth and blessedness. Do not the words then clearly declare that the love of God was so great to the church that there being no other way by which she could be saved, God the Father spared not his own true and proper Son? Make Jesus a son by office, and the whole force, not to say the meaning of the passage, is gone in a moment. It would be nothing less than plucking away the whole love of God to his people. If Jesus be not God's own proper and true son, where is the compassion of the Father's heart overcoming, so to speak, all his reluctance to give him up? Where the depth of the Father's love in delivering him up for us all? The moment that you deny the eternal sonship of Jesus, you deny the Father's love to him as his own son. And with that, you deny also the peculiar love that God has to his people. Thus, you destroy at a stroke the unutterable love and complacency that the Father has to the Son as his own son, and the compassion and love displayed to the church in giving him up as a sacrifice for her sins. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-450, 3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, 
since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.